Lord definitely enlightened me while studying for this this message. And I just thank him for it and pray that he give it to be spoken boldly and clearly and accurately the way he wants it to be spoken. Waiting on the Lord is a, is a tough time. There's, there's things that come up in our life that um, there's things that concern us, uh, education, employment, a spouse, children, healthy children. There's things that we're, we're faced that we wait on the Lord for direction and, and hope. But mainly my heart's desire is that you wait on the Lord spiritually and salvation. This is really where my heart is in this message this morning. Let's read in Isaiah 54, please. Turn to Isaiah 54. This is where the text is. Just a few verses. Verse 13 of Isaiah 54. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Now this is definitely a place where there's comfort for, for fathers and mothers to see that there's an assurance that God's going to be merciful to the next generation. But also, see this as God's children. There's peace for each and every one of God's elect. And it's, um, it's great. The peace that we have is great. In righteousness, verse 14 is powerful. In righteousness shall thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. So through the righteousness of Christ, we're free of oppression. For thou shalt not fear. Through the righteousness of Christ, we will never fear. And from terror, through Christ's righteousness, we're free from terror, for it shall not come near thee. So through the righteousness of Christ, and Christ's righteousness alone, we're free from oppression, we're free from fear, and we're free from terror. <clears throat> righteousness is important. Behold, they shall surely gather together. This is talking about those that don't like Christ. But not by me, God's saying, wait a minute, there's so those that strive against Christ and that hate Christ. Whosoever shall gather together against thee, against the elect, shall fall for thy sake. They have no power against you. Nobody can lift a finger against the elect. God's in sovereign control over it. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth the instrument of his work, and have created the waster to destroy. It's God's business to create and God's business to destroy. He is completely sovereign over everything and everyone, especially your enemies. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. Nobody can raise a tongue against the elect of God. This is why. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me saith the Lord. It's the righteousness of God Almighty that makes us separate. It's the righteousness of Christ's work, of His goodness, His obedience, that separates His people from the rest of the world. That gives us freedom from oppression, freedom from fear, and freedom from terror. It's Righteousness is so valuable and so important. And um, this message is from my heart, from God's giving me a heart as a pastor, to say, wait on the Lord for righteousness. Wait on God Almighty for righteousness. Don't try to conjure it up yourself. Wait on the Lord. The true righteousness is in Christ alone. That's what the point of the message. By way of introduction, I want you to see man's problem, man's righteousness. Man's problem. There's three sub points for the introduction because it's so important. And it's out of Romans 10.3 that I've got here so you don't have to turn to it. For there... For they, being ignorant, anybody that doesn't know God savingly, being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own or our own righteousness, have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. So these are the three points that nails down man's lost state, man's condition, before we come to know Christ savingly. We're ignorant of God's righteousness. It doesn't matter if you're in Grace Bible Church ignorant of Christ's righteousness, or you're an atheist that's never sat down under grace ministry. The point is, before God gives you a new heart, enlightenment, spiritually, you're ignorant of God's righteousness, spiritually. <clears throat> both ends of the extreme are both ignorant. 
whether you've been here your whole life and don't know God savingly, or whether you're an atheist saying, I don't agree that there's even a God at all. It's the same situation. Both ends are ignorant of God's righteousness. And when we're in that state, that natural state of man, we go about to establish our own righteousness. <clears throat> this is when we try to add to Christ's righteousness. Religious Religions all around us are strong in this. Religions all around us that are false religions that claim to know Christ, that don't really preach Christ, claim that you should go to do something to prove that you're saved. This is to add to Christ's righteousness and its wickedness. It's to add to the works of Christ. God won't have it. They take morals and say, if you're just a moral person, surely God will save you. It's not true. God has no concern for your morals. Of course, be a moral person, but if you think it's a righteousness before God, you're a fool. <laughs> Helping others, of course help others, but if you count that as your righteousness before God, you think that that's going to credit you to be accepted by God Almighty, you're an idolater. You're lost in your sin. They take, God-haters, take God's holy, righteous word, I know I did when I hated God, and turn it into a work to try to justify yourself before God. And this is in your outline. I've got Romans 9.32. They saw it. They sought it by works of the law. This is what lost man does. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. God Almighty says Christ is the rock. He's the, he's the stumbling stone that's been given to be an offense. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The offense of Christ is that the work is finished. There's no more work for man to do whatsoever for salvation. It's all done in Christ. That's offensive to the world. That's offensive to somebody that doesn't know what righteousness is. That's offensive to somebody that thinks I can conjure up my own righteousness and justify myself before God, and he better accept me. The fact that Christ completely put all sin away and all righteousness is declared in him alone is offensive to a religious person. They want their own credit in salvation. They want to be charged as good in and of themselves. They want to go to heaven and say, I deserve heaven. That's hate for Christ. That's hate for God. That's being ignorant of God's righteousness. That's going about to establish your own righteousness. And you have not submitted it. You have not been in subjection or submission to the righteousness of God. <clears throat> to know not Christ is to actually think there's someone else righteous other than Christ. Once somebody is given a new mind, a new heart, to grasp that Christ is the only righteous one, they don't account anything in their own life as good at all. They know they're desperately wicked. They know they're doomed in and of themselves. They know that their only hope is in the righteous Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If they haven't submitted themselves on the righteousness of God, they're going about to establish their own righteousness. That's the fall of Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they put the aprons on to cover their nakedness, to make themselves feel somewhat good. And it didn't work. When God came down the cool evening, they ran and hid themselves because it's not accepted. It's not good enough. When man hears that only Christ is righteous and they don't have a new heart yet to understand and to grasp that, they actually justify sin and say, I might as well go out and be more of a sinner then. Turn to Romans 3, please, to see how desperately wicked lost man is until God enlightened us. We're so, when, when Adam sinned, we fell in Adam to a complete, dark, <coughs> worthless state of no ability to save ourselves. For a person to preach that you can do something to save yourself is idolatrous. It's wicked. It's a doctrine of demons. In Romans 3. Sorry, in verse 8. And not rather as we be slanderous reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that God that good may come. The apostles writing this saying, there's people that don't like that Christ finished all the work of salvation. They don't like our message that there's only one righteous Savior, and he's the Son of God. And rest and look to him alone. They don't want that. They want their, their own works to be affirmed before God is acceptable. And they actually are saying, we're preaching evil. 
they turn it back. They turn the gospel upside down and say, we don't accept that God that's sovereign and control of everything, that only saves who he wants. They don't want anything to do with that God. And they say, let us do evil that good may come. That's not the gospel message. The gospel message is we all are evil continually. And God, Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the only good one. He expands to explain this. Verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proven, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. The apostle saying, every single person, other than the Lord Jesus Christ, is sin. The essence of complete, utter darkness, there's no light in us. You can make it clear. Look at verse 10. <clears throat> As it is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. Not one of the human race, with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, are righteous whatsoever. There is none that understand. There is none that seeketh after God. Well, what do you mean? There are scribes and Pharisees that dedicate their whole lives to know who God is. They're God-haters. They think that their works before God justifies them before God. That's the original sin. That's to think man has an ability. God says you don't have ability. Christ is the only one with the ability to save. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. Verse 12, there's none that doeth good. No, not even one. You take the very best act of a human, and God says it's not good. The very best thing that you've ever done in your life, you say, surely this is a good act that I've done this thing. I've given to the poor. I've helped an old lady across the street. I've done something that's, that surely that's good. No, there's not one thing. Their throat's an open sepulcher. It's because the religious deceit says, if you do something, you can go to heaven. That's poison. That's death. That's the message of death. That's what we died in in Adam, man's ability. Man has no ability. Their tongues, they have used deceit. Poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. It's, it's a disgrace to curse, to say cuss words. But God's saying, if you use the wrong definition for who the Lord Jesus Christ is, that is Despic that's cursing. That's poison. To actually missteer somebody to think Christ died for everybody? Wicked idolatry. Their feet are swift to shed blood. They hate those that Christ died for. They don't want anything to do with the elect. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace, have they not known? They, didn't, they don't know Christ died for a particular people. They're not resting on the work of Christ exclusively. They want their own credit before God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. They actually think they're going to stand before God and justify themselves before God. God's going to say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He only accepts Christ's blood and Christ's righteousness as atonement for sinners. So the summary and the introduction here this morning for the summary is man in our natural state completely fell to the reprobate level. There's no light in us, no ability before God. All we are is ignorant of righteousness going about to establish our own righteousness, and we have not submitted to the righteousness of God. This is the state of lost man. So now point number one, the most important point of the message. What's righteousness? What is righteousness? you got to know. Turn back to our text in Isaiah 54. you got to know what righteousness is, don't you? Don't die out of this life ignorant of righteousness. He says in Isaiah 54, verse 14, And righteousness shalt thou be established. There's no hope before thrice holy God unless you're established in righteousness. And you're going to, if you have righteousness, you're going to be far from oppression. No fear. No terror. It won't even come near you. And all these enemies in your life and even your own doubts and fears, they can't even touch it. Your soul is safe and secure inside Christ if you know the righteous, holy one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says on, at the last per, point of verse 17, This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Our righteousness, believer's righteousness, the church of God, our righteousness is of Christ exclusively and entirely. We have none of ourselves. We are resting on the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the point number one. Hebrews 12, 2 is what I wanted to preach this morning. Looking unto Jesus. Let's turn there. Hebrews 
12. I want to show you who righteousness is. Show you what righteousness is. Show you who righteousness is. Who to rest on. Who to rely on. Who to trust in. Hebrews 12, verse 2. And this verse will stand you in good stead no matter what you're going through in your life. Verse 2 of Hebrews 12 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here is all righteousness. This is the righteous Jesus, the one to look to, the one to rest on, the one to plead to for salvation. This is the single source of salvation. Here he is. You need righteousness? He's right here in this passage. Hebrews 12, 2. Jesus himself is the author and finisher of faith. I studied a little bit about the word author. And I love to use God's word to define God's word. It's so precious. In Hebrews 5, 9 is in your outline. <clears throat> Hebrews 5, 9, look at it in your outline. And being made perfect and became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Christ is is the author of eternal salvation. He's the author of it. He's the originator of it. If, if you look up the word author in Greek, it's causative. The cause, Christ is the very cause of faith. He's the beginning of faith. He's the very essence of faith or belief in God. He himself, Jesus, is faith, belief. And he also says that the word author in Greek is original. It's the beginning. The corner, the first, the magistrate, the power. Christ is the very origin of faith. And then he says he's the author and finisher of our faith. The finisher, background word, says to set out for a definite point or goal. And the, the word in Greek, finisher, is the state of completeness or perfection. Jesus is the very essence, the very finish the very completeness of perfection of faith. So back to Hebrews 12, 2, the author and finisher of our faith, God's elect have faith that's not of ourselves. Our faith is from the author and finisher, the very Son of God that established the origin of faith, which is believing that God the Father is satisfied with His work. Christ believed that the Father would resurrect him and that Christ's obedience would be accepted. And it was and is. And he finished it on the work of the cross. When he laid down his life and said it's finished on the cross of Calvary, he proclaimed faith is complete in him. He's the beginning and the end of faith. He and he alone. You can't conjure up faith. You can't make it up yourself. It has to be given to you from Christ himself because he's the author and finisher of it. So we're talking about the righteousness of God and that Jesus is the author and finisher of faith. Point number, sub point two under point one. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, what was Christ's joy? Turn to John 15 to see Christ's joy. John chapter 15. <clears throat> the very righteousness of God is Jesus Christ himself. He's the single righteous one he is the author and finisher of faith, and he was joyful to do something. Christ's joy was set before him, and his joy is, is explained in John 15 and verse 10. I'm going to expand a little bit on verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Now, the world takes this and says, see, if you do God's word, if you keep his law, you'll justify yourself before God. Fool. That's a foolish, dark perception of what God's word. He's saying, Christ is saying, even as I, I have kept my Father's commandments. It's Christ's obedience. Righteousness is all wrapped up in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's by his obedience of all the Father's commandments that openly declare he alone is God and he's able to save you from your sins. He says, I, and I abide in my Father's love. Why? Verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. Christ's joy is to take his obedience, his complete satisfaction to the Father for you. 
and charge his righteousness to you directly, personally, to fill you up with his righteousness. He says in the second half of verse 11, and that your joy might be full. He's going to take all your wicked wrath, all your wicked hatred for God out of your body, and he's going to pour in all his righteous, holy goodness. And you're going to be completely full of righteousness and goodness before God Almighty. He is the single source of salvation. He can save you from your sin. Because it's through his obedience that he charges to his elect that he's so joyful to do. <laughs> Look at the last verse of chapter 15. Blow your mind. Verse 27. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. People say that there's not an elect. We were with Christ before the foundation of the world. God the Father predestined us to be reconciled back to good standing based on Christ's work after we fell in Adam. It's the work of Christ that we're reconciled to God the Father, and He knew us from the beginning. We were with Him all that time. Yes, we fell in Adam, we fell to a reprobate level, but Christ reconciled us back to a good standing, and He knew us from the beginning of time. And he always loved us and he never forgot us. And no matter what we did, we're safe and secure in him. Wait on the Lord. I want to encourage you to wait on this God to save your wicked soul. He's able to do it because he's all righteousness. He's the very righteousness of God. He's the author and finisher of it. He, his joy is to give it to you, to fill you up with it. And he endured the cross and despised the shame. He endured it for you. The next point is in your outline. I've got Romans 6.6, 6, but before I wanted to speak about Romans 5.9. It's not in your outline, but study it later. Jot it down. Romans 5.9 it says, Being justified by Christ's blood. There's the single source of life. All man brings to the table of salvation is death and sin. Christ brings his precious holy blood that he laid down for a particular people and washed our sin away. We shall be saved from wrath through Christ, is what he says in Romans 5, 9. Saved from wrath? There's no more wrath for God's people. For those that Christ laid down his holy blood for, there's no wrath. He paid the debt. Now Romans 6, 6 is in your line. Knowing this, that our old man, that man that we fell in Adam, that man that only is darkness, that man that tries to do something to justify herself before God, all that's been crucified with Christ. It's all dead. All the wickedness that we fell in in Adam and all the things we lived out in our life before salvation is all crucified inside the Lord Jesus Christ. That the body of sin might be destroyed. He destroyed your body of sin inside Christ on the cross of Calvary if you're ever to know him savingly. And it's so complete and it's so far done. You bring up your sin with the Father, the Father say, I don't know what you're talking about. All I see is Christ's blood over top of you and all I see is love and you're safe and secure in Christ's substitutionary work for you. He endured the cross for his people. Turn to Psalm 44 to see Christ's work on the cross of Calvary. I've read Psalm 44 for years and always thought it was about the elect, but this time he showed me that this is both the elect going through torments in our life and also Christ going through torments for us. You can't separate the elect from Christ. We were with him from the foundation of the world, and he put us back into himself and died in our place and put us in good standing with the Father and puts all his joy, all his righteousness into our bodies. Psalm 44, verse 14 says, Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. It's true. God's elect, the world shakes their heads and say, I don't agree with that person. I don't like their God. Christ on the cross of Calvary, when he laid down his life for us, all of them shook their head at him and said, come down off the cross, don't die for a particular people. My confusion is continually before me and the shame of my face hath covered me. Christ took your shamefacedness on himself for you if he died for you. He covered himself in your shame. For the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and the avenger, all this has come upon us Yet have we not forgotten thee, neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. This is Christ's obedience. This is what I read in John 15, 10. I have kept my Father's commandments while Christ took our sin on himself on the cross and died in our place and took all the wrath of the Father. Christ didn't lose focus of his Father's love and the covenant that he had at all. Perfect belief, perfect 
focus on God the Father for his people to die for us and to reconcile us. Look at verse 18. Our heart is not turned back, neither have our steps declined from thy way. Christ didn't walk away. When the Father's wrath was tormenting him on the cross, Christ stayed steadfast, believing that the Father would accept his blood and resurrect him. Though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death, Christ went to the depths of hell for his people. And we were inside him at that point in time. He paid all our penalty. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to strange gods, shall not God stretch his out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. He knows that Christ's heart, perfectly holy and righteous. The elect, our hearts, we fell in Adam. Darkness, no ability in us. We had to have a substitute take us and reconcile us because we couldn't do anything to help ourselves. Christ took care of us and saved us. Yea, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. Christ praying to the Father, don't leave me in hell forever. You're going to resurrect me. Wherefore hidest thou thy face and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? Christ died in our place, and the Father won't ever forget him. He remembered him and resurrected. For our soil is bowed down to the dust. Our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly cleaveth unto the earth. This is Christ's substitutionary death in the earth, in the, in the grave for his people. Arise for our help and redeem us for thy mercy's sake. Christ praying, resurrect me, and the Father did. Christ didn't just die for his people. Had, if Christ only would have died for his people, we'd be doomed still today. He was resurrected, and in his resurrection, we have life and hope of our resurrection inside him. And we know that we're accepted because his blood is holy. His soul is holy and his water, the water of his word is holy. And God the Father accepted those three things, resurrected Christ, and we are resurrected in him. Jesus is the righteous one. This is the one to look to. Do you need righteousness? He's the single source of salvation. And now finally, Jesus sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. When I was studying this, it blew my mind away. I misread it. Set down or sat down. It both apply. God the Father set Christ down. He picked Christ up out of hell and set him in heaven with him. Openly declaring, he's the one to look to. He's my righteous holy son. Rely on his substitutionary work for you. Don't go about to establish your own righteousness. It's a bunch of worthless works that God won't accept. Rest on the finished work of Christ because he's set down in heaven. And Christ also sat down in heaven. He rested that his works are good enough for you. Would you sit down in him? God's people sit down also in the work of Christ. And we wait on him. That's point number two. And that's where my heart was in preparing this message. Wait on the Lord. Be convinced that he's the single source of righteousness. That he's the only one. Let's turn to John 6 and see one of the disciples going through this learning process that Christ is the single source of salvation. John in chapter 6. Christ teaching in verse 47 of John chapter 6. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Faith, the faith of Christ, believing Christ, that's in Christ, it's eternal life. If you believe and rest on Christ's finished work, you have everlasting life. You're safe and secure in Him. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness. They're dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven. Christ is teaching them there's a spiritual bread, and He's it. That a man may eat of thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. I laid down my life as with Christ is praying and explaining and teaching and preaching for everybody that the Father elected for me to save. And I effectively did it. And they're not just Jews. They're all around the world. They're scattered everywhere. Jump down to verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Christ is saying, I speak life directly into whomever I want to. 
it's whoever the Father's elected for me to do it to. The Father's given me the elect from before the foundation of the world, and I died for you, and I'm going to speak life into you through the spoken message. You cannot learn salvation on your own. God has to give it to you. But there are some of you that believe not. There's some that don't believe that this Christ is the real one. There's some that won't rest on the finished work of Christ. they got to conjure up their own means of salvation. Surely they're good enough to make it to heaven. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, said I unto you that no man can come unto me. Nobody has the ability to come to God whatsoever except it were given unto that man of the Father. The Father gives new life, new ears, new eyes to see and to rest on Christ. It's a gift from God that you're saved. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. He had a lot of followers at this point in time in his earthly ministry. They all walked away except the 12. Jesus opened up his mouth and said, you going to go away too, the 12? Then Peter said an amazing thing. Lord, to whom shall we go? Who, who are we going to go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He, Peter knew by God's mercy and grace. In him, in Peter, was no good thing. All there is is darkness. All there is is self-justification to try to conjure up a clean heart. And it does nothing before thrice holy God. God won't accept it. And Peter just said it the way it was. You, Jesus, have eternal life. You are righteousness. You're the single source of salvation. Peter was waiting. At that point, he was waiting. He was waiting on his Lord. And there wasn't anyone else to go to. There's nowhere else to go. This is what a new heart looks like. This is what a saved sinner looks like. Broken of yourself. No ability. All the things you tried conjuring up to, to settle your guilty conscience didn't help. Now you see that the righteous, holy Christ, the Son of God is right here in your midst. And he's speaking to you through the word saying, I am the single source of salvation. Stop your own self works and rest on my finished work for you. To wait on the Lord is to declare you have no ability. To wait on the Lord is to say, I, I need a righteousness. I lack righteousness. And Christ, he's all righteousness. He's all goodness. God the Father accepts him and accepted him and is the single source of life. I want his righteousness. This is what it is to wait on God. <clears throat> Psalm 37, 7 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Patience, waiting on God is the Holy Spirit within saying there's no other means of salvation. There's nowhere else to go, as Peter says. Where shall I go? There's no point in walking away. I'll just go to hell. There, there's no hope for my soul other than through the spoken word of Christ and his righteousness. And it's being explained right here. So I'm going to sit and wait till I'm convinced I'm okay based on Christ's work for me. He also says in Psalm 37, Fret not thyself because of him that prospereth in his way, evildoers all around you, they don't want you to rest on this Christ. They don't want you to wait on this Savior. They want you to walk away. They want you to go out and try to be righteous and good of yourself. And he says, don't fret because of those evildoers all around about you. Evildoers are those that rest on their own works to save themselves. He says in Psalm 37, 9, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. All salvation, all hope of your soul is in Christ. Don't walk away from this gospel. Stay here until God enlighten you. Rest on Christ's finished work for you. Turn to 1 Corinthians to close the message, please. 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. <clears throat> you got to know what the wisdom of God is, what righteousness is to be saved. Only God can convince you that you're a sinner and that He's the Savior. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained from the world unto our glory to bring you to salvation. 
to honor and glorify your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and make it aware that you're resting on his work, not your own anymore, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known these mysteries of Christ's righteousness, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, by the spoken word of Christ's righteousness. The spirit enters into your mind and God gives you to realize you're the sinner and he's the savior. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. You cannot know God savingly unless he comes to you and puts his new heart within you. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. There's nothing we did to earn the salvation. He freely gave it. That's grace. He laid down next to us. And he put his righteous holy body against our dead, corrupt, dead body. And he breathed life into us. Put his Holy Spirit within us. And caused us to see that we could do nothing to save ourselves. And we have to rely totally on Christ as our righteousness for true salvation. Verse 13, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So God gives you a new spirit within you upon salvation to grasp that you can do nothing to justify yourself. As like we explained in the introduction that you're just ignorant of God's righteousness, but now that you see Christ as your single source of salvation, righteousness himself in human flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, you now are resting on his work for you. And that's the use of the messages in the bottom of your outline, Ephesians 1.13 really is the same message all over again. Talking about Christ in Ephesians 1.13, look at it on the bottom of your outline. Christ in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. There's people that walk around saying that I came to a grace church and I have a higher understanding of who God is and I was saved before in the Catholic church or the Baptist church but now I see that I'm saved here too. That's, that's a fallacy. The word says in Ephesians 1.13, after that you heard the word of truth, God inserts his holy word into you after you heard the true Christ that died for a particular people that effectively put away sin by the sacrifice of himself on the cross of Calvary for his bride, for the elect of the Father. After you heard these words of truth, you trusted. You rested in the faithful one, the truthful one, the, the, the righteous one, the Lord Jesus Christ. May it be the Lord give each one here to rest on the Lord Jesus Christ alone.